An 18-year-old man sits in his garden sharpening his axe. Intensely focused, he stands up and strikes it right down through the middle of a pumpkin. Not bad, he thinks. Guess I'll try that on a stray dog later. That actually happened. We know because a medieval executioner kept diaries about his exploits. And oh my, are those entries a gruesome thing to behold. The guy that wrote that diary was Franz Schmidt. He was born in 1555 in Germany, and after practicing his chopping technique on vegetables and the odd stray animal, he went on to have a rather successful career as an executioner in the city of Nuremberg. His career lasted 45 years. In that time, Mr. Schmidt executed a total of 361 people for various offenses, some of which might surprise you. The brutal methods of execution are also sure to chill your blood. We don't know what the guy looked like, but a sketch remains in existence of him doing what he did best. As the story goes, Franz Schmidt's father, Heinrich, was kind of roped into doing the job of executioner himself before his son landed the position. One day, his pop was just going about his day as a woodsman when he saw a crowd form and he wanted to see what was up, and saw three men who'd been captured by what scholars later called a tyrannical prince. The prince said these guys had planned to murder him, and so they had to die. The problem was, there was no executioner at hand. The prince looked into the crowd and pointed out Heinrich. He said, you will execute these men. Heinrich replied something to the effect of, not in your bloody life. The prince said, you hang them or I'm gonna string you up instead, as well as the two men standing next to you. From that day on, he became the local executioner. This was not a job that people wanted to do, especially since the laws could be very strict, and the odd innocent person was hanged, beheaded, or as you'll see, even broken on the wheel. But before we get to the job at hand, let's talk a bit more about the life of an executioner. It wasn't a good one. These people were not allowed in churches, which was a big deal back then. They couldn't even go for a beer at the local tavern, seeing that one day a fellow drinker might be broken at the hands of the executioner. They weren't even allowed in their neighbor's houses. Talk about being an outcast. They were actually treated like the criminals they killed. They had to learn all of the tricks of interrogation. That included how to use torture correctly. From learned how to apply torture to a certain degree that someone would tell you something that was true, rather than they just say anything because their joints were being relieved of their sockets. He also had to know how to keep someone breathing. A dead interrogee is no good to anyone. Franz actually wanted to become a doctor. His diaries show that he was a smart guy, but as we said, he was kind of forced into doing his job. We know that he apprenticed under his father, and he really did practice on pumpkins and strays, although sometimes the executions would involve drowning someone. We don't know how you'd practice that. His clothes for the day were usually the same every time. He didn't wear a hood like we are led to believe executioners did, and he wore no kind of mask. One historian writes that hoods and masks are mostly an invention of modern people. Everyone in the town knew who the executioner was. There was no need to hide, but Franz would at least get dressed up a bit, usually wearing what's called a jerkin and a doublet. Decorating that would be a ruffled collar, and down below he'd be wearing bright hose, what looked like stockings. The picture we have of a man dressed in black looking quite mysterious is the wrong picture, at least in Germany at the time. As for how he did the job, it seems he was very skilled. Remember, there are quite a few stories throughout history when an executioner hasn't quite hit the sweet spot with his axe. That's about the worst thing they can do, prolong the agony of the victim. According to historians, and this won't surprise you, executioners in the past had a reputation for being heavy drinkers. We imagine a hard day at the office for an executioner could only really be treated with a few jugs of strong hooch. But Franz actually gave up the drink, something he states in those notes of his. It was a performance thing. If he drank before the big day, that really affected his accuracy. But get this, he also said that the condemned were allowed to drink almost as much as they wanted before they went to the chopping block or had their bodies beaten to a pulp on the wheel. The reason was to keep them calm, although they weren't allowed to drink so much that they couldn't even walk to the execution spot. They were then walked to the gallows or sometimes carried in a cart if perhaps the torture they'd suffered had made walking impossible. Then there'd be a pronouncement of some sort after which the crowd would shout and scream and sometimes throw stuff at the condemned. The crowd, wrote Franz, would do anything to get a better view of the execution. In one diary entry, he wrote that an elderly couple raced each other to the gallows. He said he was in front at the ladies' gate, but from here on, she frequently outpaced him. At times, the prisoner would ask for forgiveness from the people or even sing a final song. If they were being beheaded, they'd then have to kneel on something called the raven stone. Called that because once the ordeal was over, the ravens would come and peck the body. The judge would then say, Executioner, I command you in the name of the Holy Roman Empire, carry out the aforesaid punishment. Then the deed was done. Often the gallows were on the edge of town where heads would be put on spikes and bodies left hanging. This was a reminder to anyone coming to town what happens if you break the law. If it was a good day for Franz, the job would be finished and the public would be content. They'd all go home and wait until another day they could come out and celebrate death. But things didn't always go well. Franz wrote that one particular gentleman named Leinhard Durlein didn't exactly meet his death with calmness. Instead, he walked all the way to the Ravenstone spitting at people in the crowd. He'd had a lot to drink, still holding the bottle of booze on that last grim walk. When he finally got to the stone, 
phone, he got out his John Thomas and took a pee in front of the angry onlookers. He had one final request. He asked if he could fight four of the guards. This dying wish wasn't granted. The bottle was still in the guy's hands when his head was no longer stuck to his body. The crowd in those days could also get out of hand if the executioner needed too many strikes of the sword to sever the head. But according to Franz, he practiced all the time and so he had a 98% success rate. You have to remember, those guys used really, really long, really heavy swords. Once that thing was on its downward trajectory, it had to be exact. If the person moved just a little bit, everything could go wrong. This is why Franz had to be skilled in calming the condemned person down. The last thing the authorities wanted was anyone in the crowd feeling sorry for the prisoner. That could cause a riot, and it did at times throughout Europe, and was one reason why really brutal executions were stopped in later years. Still, as we said, the executioners were roundly disliked, even when they didn't miss. Franz wrote in his diary that he was attacked a couple of times when out in public. One time, when he was just doing his job, the crowd picked up frozen balls of mud and threw them at him. He was lucky, though, because there are reports of executioners in Germany being lynched by mobs. The authorities tried to stop people ganging up against them, but they weren't always successful. Now, you want to know why people went to the gallows? The answer is, there were many different crimes that could end in death sentences. Here's something Franz wrote in his diary one day. Five thieves who had burgled and stolen. The eldest were 22, 17, 16, and 15 years old. The youngest was 13 years old. All five hanged here at Nuremberg. Remember that they didn't have prisons back then, only cells for short-time stays. Believe it or not, according to historians, the Germans thought keeping a man in prison was a cruel and unusual punishment. It was a slow death and one without the chance to repent for their sins. But the criminals usually had to break the law more than once. They'd steal something or hurt someone and get banished from the town, but if they returned and did the same again, they were called incorrigible, unchangeable criminals for life. The only thing left was to kill them. Franz said the first execution he ever did was of a man named Hans Vogel from Rostov. In his diary, he wrote this man had burned to death an enemy in a stable. On the day of the event, Vogel had asked if he could say goodbye to a few family members and write some letters. He also asked if he could read a book in his cell prior to being taken to the chopping block. In this case, the victim's widow sympathized with the condemned, handing him some gingerbread and oranges as a sign that she had forgiven him from the depths of her heart. This guy could read, but plenty who were executed couldn't. If that was the case, they'd be visited by chaplains who would bring along a Bible. They'd sit with the condemned and read from the Bible while talking about salvation and the fact that they'd be forgiven in the afterlife. And if you think the last meal is a modern thing, think again. Franz wrote that the condemned person wouldn't only be allowed to drink as much wine as they wanted, but they also received a pretty good last meal, although they didn't get to choose what it was. The meal for some was more important than listening to the chaplains. Franz wrote that one man thought more of the food for his belly than his soul, devouring in one hour a large loaf in addition to two smaller ones besides other food. He said that once this guy was hanged, his full belly burst for all to see. Franz met with the condemned before he killed them. The usual routine would be for him to ask the prisoner for forgiveness, after which they'd usually chat for a bit and have a ceremonial drink. No booze in the case of Franz, of course. It was during this time when he was able to figure out just how the prisoner would accept his fate. If he or she was panicking too much, Franz would order more booze. If he thought that wouldn't even do the trick, he'd ply the prisoner with alcohol spiked with some kind of sedative. He said at times he was able to convince some women to calm down by telling them they could wear their favorite hat. One woman named Elizabeth Mechlin seemed at first to take her fate on the chin. She was still weeping all the time, but she told the crowd that she was glad to leave this vile and wicked world and would go to her death not otherwise than as to a dance. Still, Franz wrote that the nearer she approached to death, the more sorrowful and faint-hearted she became. He said by the time she had her head on the Ravenstone, she was absolutely hysterical. That day, he needed three strikes to get the job done. To put that into perspective, he only needed two strikes and four out of all the rest of his executions. That day, he wrote the German word for botched in his diary. To understand the gravity of the situation, in some German towns, if the executioner needed two or three strikes, the mob would get hold of him and he'd find himself on the Ravenstone being the one executed. When things went right, Franz would say, Lord Judge, have I executed well? He'd receive the reply, you have executed as judgment and law have required. Criminals generally couldn't choose the way they died, except for noble people when they were faced with death. You have to wonder now, what you'd choose from hanging, beheading, breaking on the wheel, or drowning? They almost always chose beheading, because the other options were painful and at times very humiliating. As for how much Franz got paid, his diary said he was on a weekly salary, but he often got bonuses for when he had to torture someone. Sometimes he'd get paid more for the torture and then get another bonus for healing the person after. This is why he wanted to become a doctor. He preferred the healing part. It said he treated 15,000 people in and around his local town, folks who hadn't first been tortured by him. Overall, he was paid very well. He might have hated his job at times, he might have gone home full of sorrow and had people throwing things at him, but he always had cash in his pocket. The times were tough, though, and it seems he did get some job satisfaction. In those diary entries, he wrote a lot more when the condemned were particularly horrible people. Just like today, there were violent psychopaths who committed 
committed the most heinous of crimes. We bet you can guess what form of execution they got, being broken on the wheel, of course. Franz wrote that one time he had to break two men on the wheel. They were terrible fellows who did something we can't fully describe here, but it involved a very vulnerable and innocent person having their throat cut. They were robbers and they believed his superstition that if you take the life of a young person that you'll gain the superpower of invisibility. From his tally of executions you can see that most people were hanged, closely followed by beheading. Only the worst of people were broken on the wheel. He describes the process like this. The person was spread eagled on a large cartwheel and tied to it. Franz would then bash away. But if the person had done something particularly nasty and the crowd wanted to see someone in a lot of pain, he would start slowly from the feet until the person was completely broken. Only then would he attack the head. He wrote that starting at the head was a merciful death. He didn't just execute people though, he also beat them in public as a punishment. He carried out hundreds of floggings, but also did what he called finger choppings and ear clippings. Some of the finger chop victims were prostitutes, poachers, and perjurers. He branded pimps with in for Nuremberg, and he at least once cut off the end of a man's tongue for blaspheming. As for the torture we talked about earlier, the reason was to get information from the person if it was thought he had conspirators or hidden stolen valuables. The torture would usually involve red hot pincers, but in Franz's bag of tricks were also thumb screws, a skull crusher, leg splints, and a torch he would light and apply to a person's armpits. If you're wondering what policing was like back then, this amazing diary also gives us lots of details. This is a bit long-winded, but we think you need to hear the full entry about how a man was arrested. He lay in wait for his very own father, a steward at Osternol in the castle, upon his folding ground, hiding behind a rock and covering himself with brushwood so that he couldn't be seen. When his father climbed a pole, which they called the ambush tree, to take down the decoy bird, he shot him with a round of four bullets so that he died the next day. Although no one knew who had done it, as he fled from the place and while running he dropped a lost glove, which a tailor at Grafenberg had patched for him the day before. This glove was found by a woman, thereby revealing the deed. He killed his own father, which was about as bad a crime as could get back then in Germany, just as it is now. In this case, there could be no other form of execution than breaking the wheel, although Franz also burned him with hot pincers as he took him to the scaffold. He started from the bottom up for this man. We don't want to know how many blows it took, but another entry about the wheel, he said 31 strikes did the job. On November 13, 1617, Franz wrote about his last execution. The entry starts like this, burnt alive here a miller of Manberna, who however was lately engaged as a carrier of wine because he and his brother, with the help of others, practiced coining and counterfeiting money and clipping coins fraudulently. He had also a knowledge of magic. The miller, Karl Lambrecht, had apparently turned down the opportunity to be beheaded. When it came time for his death, Franz fastened him to what he called a judgment chair. He then put straw under the chair and gunpowder around his neck. The crowd couldn't see it, but Franz had actually also tied a thin rope around the man's neck. When he lit the fire, he told his assistant to pull it tight and therefore spare the man the agony of the flames. The assistant didn't do his job properly though. The man howled in pain, screaming, Lord Jesus, take my spirit. That was one botch for a man who didn't make many mistakes. It wasn't what Franz called a good death. While he gained respectability doing a job usually reserved for the lowest of people, his life was full of tragedy. In 1585, two of his kids died from the plague. Fifteen years later, his wife and other son went the same way. He lost a granddaughter and a son-in-law while they were both still young, and his last surviving son was also killed by the plague. He didn't pop his clogs until he was the ripe old age of 79. Historians say he had a lavish funeral and was buried in the best part of the cemetery, becoming the first executioner ever to get that kind of VIP treatment in death. Now you need to watch Worst Punishments in the History of Mankind compilation, or have a look at this.